Bill, would they or wouldn't they resume opening arguments in the O.J. Simpson trial? That was the question surrounding the events this morning. And in the end, Johnny Cochran was not allowed to go on with the show. And this is why. Penny, the notorious Al Cowlings, wants all of America to reach out and touch him so he can tell us about his life. And now, for a mere $2.99 per minute, we can all hear the world according to Al. Jim, with the eyes of the world still glued on the O.J. Simpson story in Los Angeles, almost everything else has become a footnote in the news, including America's last big-time scandal, the story of Tanya Harding and her ex-husband, Jeff Galuli. But just because they're no longer grabbing headlines doesn't mean that their bizarre drama is over, as I found out during a return visit to their hometown, Portland, Oregon. And it certainly had the feel of a presidential motorcade with dozens of cops and hundreds of spectators at every major intersection here in Brentwood as the O.J. Simpson soap opera took its act on the road. It looks to me like everybody who's in there now is risking their own lives. Uh, they are, but when you're... Uh, there's a difference between a rescue and a recovery, and you take, you take a lot of risk for a rescue, you try to minimize those risks during a recovery operation, and in some, in some cases this is a recovery. So the crews are going to... More and more it's looking like yeah. it's a recovery than a rescue. 13, 14 hours, you still have any kind of faith that there could be people in there. Oh, sure. We saw it in San Francisco, too. So, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Okay. okay. And as midnight came and went, the rescue teams had settled in for the long haul. As you can see, there are still dozens of paramedics, police, firefighters still on scene here. Just within the last hour, we are told that they have found a 15th victim underneath the collapsed unit of this apartment complex just behind me here. The workers are now underneath that building in very small, dangerous spaces, trying to get to that victim to bring them out. It's going to be a very long night here. It's already been a very, very long day. But Nathan's real-life movie came to an abrupt halt in a small roadside motel in the state of Nebraska, when a local cop ran a routine check on a car without a state plate. It came up wanted, and soon the SWAT team moved in. Beyond belief, we'll call on the services of some of the most renowned experts, explorers, and scientists. And each week, our viewers will be treated to four exciting segments of mysteries, myths, and real-life miracles. Everyone has experienced deja vu. It's a real phenomenon, but just how does it work? We know, and the truth will astound you. And we've all picked up the daily newspaper to check out our horoscopes. Often, they're right on target. Does astrology really work? Can psychics really predict the future? These are just a few of the countless mysteries that occur in our daily lives that people want to know the truth about. Jim, every Thursday night for months, in the building just behind me, 14 complete strangers would get together for a kind of intensive group therapy session. Among them, two women who found they shared a very special bond. Both were victims of abusive husbands. One was Nicole Brown Simpson, and tonight the other woman steps forward to tell her story. Our special correspondent, Brooke Skolsky, is here now with this exclusive report. Brooke. And there is one rather ironic aspect to this story. If Nathan Martinez is convicted of killing his beautiful young sister and his stepmother, he'll do his time here at the Utah State Prison which just so happens to be located in Nathan's hometown, just a few miles down the road from the scene of the crime. Penny? I think still one of the great mysteries or the great questions about this, Tanya has consistently denied that she knew about this attack beforehand. Did she? Yeah. Yeah, she knew. I think that, you know, it's funny that, that you asked me that question because nobody asked me that question. Ever, anybody that's halfway intelligent knows that she was involved from the beginning. Nobody believed that she wasn't involved. I mean, this is your real avid Tanya Harding fan. It's obvious to most everybody. Can I ask a couple questions? Nope. I don't have anything to say to you. Okay. How are you doing? Can I just get out of my face? Jamie couldn't even finish our interview without needing to shoot up. You're a smart, good looking, obviously intelligent guy. Right? And I'm doing something that's obviously stupid. Stupid. It's ruining your life. I'm well on my way to 
burning my life. That's right. What happened to Jamie is a mystery. Growing up here in Seattle, Jamie attended the best schools and lived in an upscale neighborhood. But the day Jamie took his first blast of dope when he was in his early 20s, his life changed forever. It doesn't matter if you're a rich man or a poor man, your mind becomes your enemy and there's no rest from it. According to Jamie, the price for this pleasure can be crippling. It, it does give one the feeling of despair, of, of hopelessness, and uh, there's a great deal of depression that goes along with it. Your every waking hour and every waking energy has gone into staying high. Right. Is that a, I mean, I'm asking you, is that a fair assessment? It, it's a fair assessment, and, and... So when you go to bed after a day like that and knowing you're going to get up and do the same damn thing tomorrow... If I'm lucky, I'll be able to do the same thing tomorrow. The alternative is to... is to become very ill. But Seattle certainly isn't the only place where heroin use is raging. Today, across the country, it's estimated there are a half million heroin junkies. And here in Hollywood, where trends often come and go with the blink of an eye, Suddenly, heroin has been cast into a leading role, both in the movies and in real life. And this new plan calls for Keiko not only to get a new tank, which will be nearly three times the size of the one here in Mexico, but he'll also get something he's never had in his life, a mate. Prosecutor Bozanich seemed to pay little attention to Lyle's tales of abuse, conceding that his childhood was less than happy. Instead, she focused extensively on the crucial issue of imminent danger, attempting to prove that these two strong, athletic young men were not really in a life-or-death situation at the time they shot and killed their parents. Your mother wasn't sneaking, was she? She was trying to get away from being shot to death. I don't know. Without a doubt, Lyle's testimony has been some of the most compelling ever heard in an American courtroom. His story of abuse and domination held us all on the edge of our seats. Yet, was it reason for murder? Were the boys about to be killed by parents afraid that their dark secret would be exposed? If the jury doesn't buy it, then Lyle Menendez may be on his way to the California gas chamber. Penny, it all looks very different here today. Gone is the 277-unit Northridge Meadows apartment complex, the place that became the symbol of last year's deadly earthquake. 16 people lost their lives here, and only moments after the shaking, I arrived and spent nearly three days at this location, covering that terrible tragedy. But of course, there was some good to come out of that story, like the heroics of the hundreds of people who rushed in to lend a hand. And perhaps the most inspiring story of all, the young couple who found love here among the ruins. Now let's go to Mike Watkins in L.A. to hear what people are talking about there. Mike, anything different at the courthouse today? Jim, I think that pictures speak louder than words, and I have a piece of videotape I'd like to show you that will give you some sense of the circus atmosphere we've seen every day since this preliminary hearing started last week. Jim, a lot of ranks are on the sidewalk, as you can see, people with very strongly held opinions. And I'm seeing today that the debate out here is reflecting what's going on in the courtroom. We've seen that every day. So people are talking about whether this evidence should be admitted. Some people are very concerned about OJ's civil rights. Some people are saying it really seems like his defense team is focusing on a technicality and not addressing the power of the evidence. You know, Mike, it seems that uh, Marsha Clark, the prosecutor, is presenting just enough evidence to get an indictment and no more. Is there any uh, other talk about the witnesses or evidence she may have up her sleeve if and when this case goes to trial? Well, you're absolutely right. The state is not going to lay their entire hand on the table. They're presenting what they think they need to convince this judge to find it over for trial. Uh, we're going to see more about court records. We will, uh, at that point, have long-anticipated DNA results, and there'll be a lot more witnesses. So you, bet, you can bet that Marsha Clark is not playing her full hand right now, Jim. All right, then, Mike. Thank you. We'll check in with you again tomorrow.